today we come to worship you. We've already begun through the singing, through the music, through the praying, through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And now we come to focus upon the very word of God. Allow that to speak to us. May we open our hearts that you may speak. May we uh, uh, open our ears that we may hear what the word has to say to us today. Thanks again for our time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Madeline. You did good. Dad was okay, but you did good. Thank you for sharing with us today. Turning your Bible, if you will, today, we're going to be using two uh, passages today. Uh, the, the first passage, just a couple of verses in Revelation. Uh, then we're going to move fairly quickly uh, over to 1 John, the second chapter. So uh, if you just want to turn to one of those, I would encourage you to turn to uh, 1 John. But first, let's just share the couple of verses that we want to set the tone of our message taken from uh, the book of Revelation itself, the very first chapter and the seventh and the eighth verse. The apostle John writing, remember John now had been one of the uh, 12 apostles and he wrote the book of John in the uh, four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And he's right, he wrote also in three small books of John uh, in the back of your Bible just before we get to the book of Revelation. But uh, let's just read a couple of verses in, uh, in Revelation 1, 7 and 8. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. And then the last verse, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. So today we'll be going, we're going to be talking about end time events. We know that there's a lot going on in our world today with uh, the election that is coming up, with all of the, uh, the inhumane slayings that is taking place, the bombings. Uh, and all of this, and, and I believe that we're getting close to the time that Christ is coming back. Now, that's nothing new for one to believe, uh, because even John felt that Christ was coming back in his day. So when I say I believe, that doesn't mean he's coming today, but let me tell you what, uh, he can come today. All that is supposed to have been revealed uh, has been revealed, and as John closed his book, in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, the 20th verse, he which testified these things saith, surely come quickly. Surely come quickly. So that's kind of where we're going today, and we're going to uh, place emphasis upon the uh, latter verses that we'll be reading uh, just a little bit later uh, in the message, but we've titled our message soon and very soon. Uh, I believe without a doubt with the events that are taking place that we're very close to Christ coming back again. What we're going to do, we're going to share this message in two phases. Uh, number one, we're going to look at the end time events and most of these I have already spoken from the pulpit and I don't uh, feel like there's a need to go back and get involved in those that much. But the latter one, uh, which is dealing uh, with the Antichrist, that's what we're going to spend most of our time this morning in dealing with. But first, we want to look back at, at the end time events. And the number one event, I think the only thing that, that needs to be fulfilled for Christ, to, uh, for Christ to come back a second time, remember now the rapture uh, is the very next thing on God's event. And at that time, Christ does not come all the way back to the earth. He just comes in the clouds and he calls out the church. The, the rapture is the, is the taking of the church out of the world for a short period, for a short period. It is not just going to be Baptist. It is going to be every born again believer that will take place in that rapture. And yes, that can happen today. That can happen in our lifetime. I never will forget over in the little white church a number of years ago, uh, we had a fellow by the name of Milford Garrett that did many revivals. As a matter of fact, he did over seven revivals for us while we was over there. And he believed that God, that Jesus Christ was coming back in his 
lifetime. He felt that very much. And he would always say, I'm not going to die. I'm going to be taken up in the rapture. Well, that didn't quite happen in the rapture as we see it, but he was taken up. He has gone on, and now he, he, he realizes that death is not the end for God's people. It is really the beginning of God's people to live the life that God prepared for us to live all the way back in the book of Genesis when God created and when he had finished his creation before he sat back and, and rested on that, on that seventh day, he looked over what he had made and he said, behold, it's very good. We're going to live in that atmosphere for all eternity. We're going to live in that atmosphere for all eternity. So the rapture is the very next thing uh, on God's calendar. Uh, if you want to read that later, it's in 1 Thessalonians, at least portions of it, uh, the fourth chapter, the 13th through the 8th verses. The next thing that happens, and this is why the rapture is the prelude, is the prelude to the tribulation period. There is going to be a time, and the Bible refers to that in two sections, one uh, uh, three and a half year period, and then the second three and a half year period. The first three and a half year period is going to be fairly peaceful. The church, the church is out of the way. You no longer have to fool with those uh, individuals. They're out of the way. Now we can live the way we choose to live. Now we can do the things that we choose to do. Because no longer are they there. The first half of the trib period is going to be fairly peaceful. I, I, I see that the stock markets are going to climb and going to be a great time. This is going to be an individual that the whole world will love. He may come on the scene early in the political arena. He's able to do great things. He's able to say great things. And everybody, even the whole world, he, he's bringing the whole world together. And the whole world is able to vote for this individual as he takes over. It's going to be very pleasing to the whole world. Now, I want to say something that uh, uh, I feel like I need to say very early. The two individuals that are running for office in November that you and I will go out and elect an individual. And I want to remind you that it is our duty. It is our duty as a child of God to register and to vote. I'm hearing now that we don't have that much to choose from, but we must make a choice. And sometimes it comes to a choice of choosing the lesser of the evils. Sometimes it comes to that choice, but we're responsible for going out. And we will have a say in the next four years. I watched the Republican convention, at least most of it. And one of the things that was said that, that, that I, I guess impressed me as much, if not more than any other thing that was said, was the fact that in the next four or eight years of whoever is in the White House, that they're going to change the balance of the Supreme Court so much that it will not only affect the world for four years, but it will affect the world for the next 40 years that is to come. So folks, let me encourage you. If you haven't registered, to do so, it is our obligation as a Christian to vote and make sure that you're able to do that. The rapture or the tribulation period is the time that the church is out of the way. There's no more of those good guys or goody-goody people. There's no more of them telling us what we can't do. We're able to do whatever we like. We've got a man in place to do whatever he chooses because we believe in him and we're going to follow him. But then at that mid-period of that tribulation period, this guy is going to turn uh, colors and Satan gives him his power, whatever he has, and then he begins to rule 
with a rod of iron, and no one is able to buy or sell unless they take a mark that the Bible calls 666. And I can't say that I understand all of that, but I do know that it's a mark that we must take or one must take living here or they cannot buy or sell anything whatsoever. It becomes a terrible time. It is when God pours out his wrath upon unbelievers. That is what the trip period is all about. But let me tell you, God has given us a choice. God has given us a choice. Should we be living in the trib period, in that time, we don't have to be a part of that. That's what the rapture is all about. It takes the church out during the tribulation time. Yes, at the time that God completes his covenant with Israel, he hasn't done that yet. We're told in the Bible that, that it was promised that there would be a man of God or at least a man like David in the, uh, in, the, in, in the ruling section. We call it the king in the Old Testament times. There'll be a man in that for all eternity, for all times. And that's not happening right now. Not in America, not in any other parts of the world. Not in any other parts of the world. So that, again, is what is going to take place in the trib period. It is God working with Israel to pull the true believers aside during that time and complete his covenant with Israel. That, indeed, is a whole another message, and we've used that before. The third thing that has to happen is the second coming of Christ. Now, the second coming of Christ is not the rapture because Christ doesn't come all the way down. The second time Christ comes, the second time comes, he's coming all the way to the earth and set up a kingdom for 1,000 years. Now listen to me. Every born-again believer, and born-again believer is nothing spectacular or whatever. It just means that we believe that when we accept Christ that we began a new life. Doesn't mean we are super duper 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 Christian. Doesn't mean that at all. Doesn't mean we're a preacher. Doesn't mean we're a teacher. Doesn't mean we're a deacon. Doesn't mean we're, we're a great singer or anything of that nature. It means that we have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. And those people are going to be taken up in the rapture. Going to be taken up in the rapture. But when Christ returns, the second coming... When he returns, you can read portion of that in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. When he comes back, every born-again believer that has ever lived is going to come back with him. Is going to come back with him. That's going to be a, a, a very special time. But Christ himself will be leading. Will be leading that army. This pastor... Don't believe that the church will be fighting at all in that battle. Don't believe that the church will be fighting at all because we aren't in some camouflaged outfit. We're in white, shiny robes or clothing. Meaning that we're dressed to follow Jesus. We're dressed to worship God. We aren't dressed to fight a battle. The first thing that happens when Christ returns with you and I, with him, if we are a child of God, is a big battle. We call it the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19, 19, 21, we'll share portions of that with you. We call it the Battle of Armageddon. It is going to be fought. It is going to be fought, believed by most scholars, in the Valley of Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is only mentioned once in the Bible. That was mentioned by John the Apostle, who also had the encounter with Jesus Christ or his angel on the Isle of Patmos when he was in, in isolation and told to write the letter to the seven churches. And then in, in Revelation 16, 16 is the only place that you'll find the word Armageddon. Over 200 battles, we're told, has already been fought there. 
It is about, I'm told, 80 miles north of Jerusalem. And over 200 battles have already been fought there. So what greater place to fight the final battle between good and evil there in that valley. When Christ comes back and you and I as Christian people are with him, I believe according to the word of God that that's going to be one of the shortest battles probably that ever was fought. Because all of the nations are going to rise against Christ and his forces and try to defeat him. That is the time that good wins over evil. You've heard the statement a number of times before, even probably from this pulpit, is that we know the ending. We know who wins. And Jesus Christ, God's son, with his church, is going to come back and that battle will be very short and evil will be put down for all eternity. Evil will be put down for all eternity. And we know that evil is rampant in this 21st century that you and I are living in. So the battle of Armageddon is going to be a time in which you and I will be present, but never in danger. You and I will be present, but never in danger during that battle. And then there becomes the millennium period. That is a time that Christ sets up a kingdom and rules personally himself. In that resurrected body that rose from the grave on that Easter morning. After he was killed, brutally killed for you and for me. He's going to be in that body and he is going to set up rule. And we won't have to vote for that. Let me remind you, there will be no registering to vote. We won't have to vote. God is in control at this time. God is in control at this time. And you and I. Listen to me. If we're Christians, our followers of Jesus Christ, we will be present during that time. We're talking about the end times. That means don't let me ramble or get us off of that, that subject or the direction that we're going. We're talking about the end time. Then at the end of the millennial period, the Bible tells us something that I don't fully understand, but... I know that it's biblical and I know that it's true. Satan is going to be released for a short time. And then those that have lived under what they call the oppression of the reign of Jesus Christ will show their full colors. And then they will be taken care of in that time too. That is a time that every person that has ever died without Christ will stand before him. To give an account of their lives. Now there are two judgments. One for the Christian. That is we call it the Bema judgment. That is not for salvation. But it is for two things. One to give an account of our lives. What we have done. Whether they be good or bad. And the second thing. Or I think the first thing. Is that it is to issue rewards. For the work that we have done. I think during that time. We might be surprised. At who gets the rewards and who don't. Because the reward is going to be given out by, by, by Jesus Christ. And those rewards are going to be for the people that didn't do something just because we had to. They did it because they chose to. Maybe it'll be a great prayer warrior. I don't know. Maybe it'll be a great giver. I don't know. But I do know it will be somebody. Somebody. That has had their hearts clean. That has walked with God. That has followed Jesus Christ. That has obeyed his commandments. Not for recognition. But deep back in the background. Why? Because God sees deep back in the background of our hearts. He knows why we're here today. He knows why we do what we do. 
And he'll give rewards or not give rewards based upon the depth of the commitment to God and to Jesus Christ in our hearts. That's what happens here. That's what happened in the beam of judgment. And then, of course, the great white throne judgment. Uh, no child of God will be involved in that. That is an awful judgment. And then the new heaven and the new earth where Jesus reigns. All of the earth that we see now is going to be done away with. You know, we talk about, uh, and we have, we've raped this country that we live in. We've raped this world that we live in. We've taken from it without giving back. It's scarred. But it is not going to be just renovated. It's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. And I often think when I'm in a study like this, why a new heaven? One day there was a battle in heaven, remember? Satan tried to take over. Tried to become God. Tried to overcome. And he was booted out. So heaven has some scars. You won't read that in your theology book. That's Holostonian theology. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Why do I believe that? The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. But there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And then the second thing that I want to place some emphasis on today is the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? What is the Antichrist? Who, who, is he living today? Let's take a look. Let's read our scripture. Turn with me in your Bibles to John, the uh, first John. The first, second chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. And you may want to mark this and do some studying in it yourself. John's Gospel. In the back of your testament, 1 John. The second chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. And, and John is writing. Little children. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the children of God. Every child of God is still growing. Just like our physical children, they, they grow. We, we have to teach them. We have to lead them. So the Christian is still growing. Little children. It is the last time. Now what John is referring to here, it is the last time. Not the last time I'll write to you. Not the last time I'll speak to you. But it's the last days. You see, John. John, like the other disciples, expected Jesus to come back in their time. In their time. You remember when Jesus had them all on the mountain there getting ready to go up after his, uh, after, just before his ascension and after his uh, resurrection. He'd been with them and here on this earth for 40 days in a resurrected body. And he called them out to the mountain and he said to them, I'm going away, but I'll come back. And then after he ascended up, they were so uh, awestruck at that. And I'm sure they would have been. I would have been too. You would have been too. And as they were looking after he'd gone out of sight and stood looking, I don't know how long they looked, but an angel come and said, men, why do you stand here gazing into heaven? The same Jesus that you saw taken up is coming back again. Go back to Jerusalem. Wait for orders from God. Wait for the Holy Spirit to descend to empower you. And then you have work to do. But they thought he was coming back again. And John is writing in that, same, in that same frame of mind. This is the last time. This is the last days. And you have heard that the Antichrist. Now let me remind you that the word Antichrist is only used four times in the Bible. And all of those is by John himself. It's mentioned in 1 John the second chapter, the 18th verse. It's mentioned again in the second, first John, the second chapter, the 22nd verse. It's mentioned again in first John, the fourth chapter. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the fourth book of John. And there's only one chapter in there, verse three. And it's mentioned again. Well, I'm sorry. In John, it's, it, it's more chapters. It's fourth chapter of first John. The second, uh, uh, second John, the last time it's mentioned is in second John. And that's only one chapter. And it's verse seven. Four times, all mentioned by John himself, an antichrist. What is an antichrist? Well, anti means that we're against something. 
An antichrist is anyone that does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is our Savior, and that He is the only way into heaven. Don't forget that. When some of these folks come knocking on your door, find out what their beliefs are in Jesus Christ. Find out what their beliefs are. Let's pick up at 19 and finish reading this. They went out from us. There were people that was a part of the Jesus movement that never accepted Christ, kind of like Judas. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They never signed up spiritually. For if they had been with us, been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. There was not a part of God's church, the church that Jesus set up in the book of Revelation. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not destroy it. Verse 20, but you have an unction from the Holy Spirit and you know all things. You have a feeling from the Holy Spirit that there are certain things that are not right. And because of that, we try to stay away from them. We try to back off from them. That is the Holy Spirit prompting us that this is not what you should be doing as a child of God. We have a choice to listen or not listen. Verse 21. I have, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And the time and that no lies are in the truth. The last verse we're reading, 22nd. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Listen. He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. I would suggest you mark that verse in your Bible. And then someone knocks on your door to give you some literature. You get them to explain that verse to you. And if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to go to heaven, Listen to me. According to the word of God, that is an antichrist. That is an antichrist. Now, there's going to be a big boy antichrist that's coming in the last times. This is not that guy. This is anyone that doesn't believe Jesus Christ. How do I know that the Bible tells me so? That's why I know. That's why I know. And that's why you need to know. And you do know. But that's why I mentioned it today. Just mark it in your scriptures. Mark it in your scriptures. So the Antichrist, in 1 John 2 and 18, it mentions the Antichrist. And you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Note that first Antichrist is singular. <coughs> Excuse me. Even now there are many, many Antichrists, plural, in the world. So even in John's day, even in John's day, there were non-believers. They were antichrist. So there have been antichrist in the world, even from John's time, and even through this 21st century that we're living in. And one day, one will stand out over all of the others. And that one will become not just our president, but will become a world ruler. But that won't take place until the church has been taken out. That's why, that's why it's so important that, 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 we, that we 
are Christian people. There are many antichrists. And then 1 John 4, 1 and 3, uh, uh, 1 John, the fourth chapter, uh, verses 1 and 3. And let me read those verses to you very quickly. Behold, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that doesn't believe that is not of God. So, 1 John remind us again that, that there are many antichrists out there and are living even in our day. And then he's called by, by John the man of sin. The man of sin. That, that we find in Thessalonians verse 2. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. As I read the material that comes across my desk. I find that churches are decreasing by the numbers. Churches are even being shut down by the numbers. What does that mean? A falling away. Somebody giving up. Somebody getting tired of, of constantly trying and, and something doesn't happen. Or maybe just as in John days, somebody gets tired of Christ not coming back and getting us out of this awful condition that we might be in. They're shutting down. So here we find that he's called the man of sin. And also he's called the man of perdition. Perdition just simply means evil. It means bad. And one of the descriptions given in my Bible dictionary was it meant useless. That is the Antichrist that is coming. And I believe there's one more. I believe Revelation I think called him the beast. Let me say yes. The beast. So this is the Antichrist that, that is coming. An awful person that is going to come in and win the hearts of the people all over the world. And then the second half of his reign is when all evil is going to be poured out. The fact is that, that this should not be a message of doom. It should be a message of hope. You see, we're still on this side of the rapture. We're still on this side of the tribulation period. We still have a choice. If you haven't chosen, today would be the day that I'd encourage you to choose. Father, thank you. Thank you for reminding us again today of where we are in the world situation. But also reminding us of who we are. Reminding us of what's coming and how we can be the best part. Involved in the best part of what's coming. Father, I never intended this message to be scary. Tended to be a love writing. Saying that God loves us so much. That he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for us. And then to be buried. And then to rise again. And to ascend back into heaven. To where he's coming back to receive us to himself. Your will be done today father. Whether we need to make decisions or not. Your will be done. In Jesus name I pray. Amen.